All right, guys, welcome back. This is 1.4, where we will be calculating limits by hand. No calculator necessary, right? Way better this time. Okay, uh, before we get started, there's a couple, couple, there's 10 limit laws or limit properties. Um, so before we start, let f and g be two functions. Assume that the limit of f is equal to some number l and the limit of g is equal to some number m. Where l and m are real numbers, then number one, the limit as x approaches some number a of k is equal to k for any constant k. What does that mean? That means that the limit of the constant is a constant. And I'll write examples down so you know what these laws are all about. Okay. So for number one, if I said, let me move up a bit. If I said the limit, hang on. If I said the limit as x approach some number a of five, and five is a constant because five does not have a variable. Remember, that's the definition of a constant. A constant is just a number. So the limit of five would still be five. That's it. That's how it works. Okay, number two. The limit as x approaches some number a, and remember, a could be any number it wants. I could have went to my example that I wrote down and said let x approach zero, or let x approach 10, or let x approach 100. No matter what, the limit would still be five. Okay, two. The limit as x approaches a of x is equal to a. So number two, is an actual direct substitution property. It has a name to it. This limit says, hey, just plug in a for x. That's all it says. So I guess I have to do a better example for this one. If I said the limit as x approach two of x, well, this just says plug two in for x. So the limit as x approaches two of x would be two. There you go. Three, we don't need an example for this one. All this one says is the limit as x approaches a of f plus or minus g can be split into multiple limits. The limit of f plus or minus the limit of g. So however many terms are in there, you can split into multiple limits. Okay. Four, the limit as x approaches a of some number k times f of x is equal to k times the limit of f of x. So all this says is, hey, take this coefficient of k and move it to the outside. That's all this says. So I can put an example for that one. This one says the limit as x approaches, I'll just say zero, of 5x squared. Well, all this says is take that 5 and move it to the front. That's it. So this becomes 5 times the limit as x approaches zero of x squared. That's it. Take whatever coefficient you have, move it to the front. Five is just like number three, but it's over multiplication. The limit as x approaches a of f of x times g of x is equal to the limit of f of x times the limit of g of x. So you can apply limits over multiplication. Okay. And six, same thing like three and five. The limit can be applied over division, over a quotient. The limit as x approaches a of f over g is the same as the limit of f over the limit of g. So you can, you can apply the limit to the numerator and the denominator of a quotient. Okay, seven, 
the limit as x approaches a of f of x to the n is the same as the limit of f of x to the n. So you can apply the limit inside that power function. So I guess I can make an example of that one. Let's say you had the limit as x approach 0 of x plus 1 q. Well, all this property says is, hey, take this limit and put it inside. There you go. Just like that. All right. Number eight is just like number two, a direct substitution property. The limit as x approaches a of x to the n is the same as a to the n. So all this says is, hey, plug in a for x. That's it. All right, no, uh, yeah, we don't need an example for that one. Number nine is just like number eight and number two. Again, direct substitution. The limit as x approaches a of the nth root of x is the same as the nth root of a. All this says is, again, plug in a for x, whatever number a may be. 10 is just like what, number seven? Yeah, just like number seven. The limit as x approaches a of the nth root of f of x means you can apply the limit inside that radical. So you get the nth root of the limit of f of x. All right, sure. Example for that one. The limit as x approaches 2 of the cube root of x. Well, we can rewrite it as the cube root of the limit as x approaches 2 of x. So you can apply the limit inside the radical. OK, excellent. Those are our 10 properties. So let's go ahead and see if we can apply any of these 10 properties to the limits below. OK. And as you see there, each of these properties is also valid for limits at the left or limits at the right. Left-hand limits, right-hand limits. OK. So evaluate the limits and justify each step. This means we want to use the properties above to justify each step. So what we see here is the limit as x approaches 5 of 2x squared minus 3x plus 4. There are three terms inside this limit, which means go ahead and apply the limit to each term. So this means that we can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 5 of 2x squared minus the limit as x approaches 5 of 3x. Move, move up a bit. And plus the limit as x approaches 5 of 4. OK. Well, we just have expanded this limit expression over into three limits, right? Over addition and subtraction. OK. Let's try to expand it a little more by using the properties above. We have coefficients of 2 and 3. What can we do with coefficients? We can move it to the outside of the limit. So this will become 2 times the limit as x approaches 5 of x squared minus 3 times the limit as x approaches 5 of x plus the limit as x approaches 5 of 4. OK. And now, all we have to do now is use what? Rule number two and eight, I believe it was, or just the direct substitution property. So for the first two, for x squared and x, you'll plug in five. So here's what we have next. You'll have 
2 times 5 squared minus 3 times 5 plus, and this very last limit uses the constant rule, the very first rule. The limit of the constant is the constant. So what is the limit of 4? No matter what value x is approaching, the limit of 4 will still be 4. There you go. Now sum it up. What is that? 25, 50, 50 minus 15 is 35. What do we get? 39? Oh, I hope that's right. There you go. And now that is justifying it step by step by step. Do we have to do that every single time? No, we do not. We could have just said, hey, use the direct substitution property already. Plug in five. If we plugged in five already, we would have been home a long time ago. All right? But the reason for this exercise is to show you how these limit properties work. Because you could have used them without even knowing that you were using it. So this just introduces you to it. Do we have to do it on the next problem? No. Let's go ahead and try the direct substitution property automatically. We are done with this life. So two, the limit as x approaches negative two of x cubed plus two x squared minus one over five minus three x. Yes, you can apply the limit to the numerator. Yes, you can apply the limit to the denominator, but why not just plug in negative two? It's as simple as that. So let's go ahead. We will use direct substitution property right away. I'll do a different color, why not? Negative two cubed plus two times negative two squared or minus one over five minus three times negative two. All right, what is that? Negative eight, that's four and two, so what's that? Is that just negative 1 over, that becomes 6, negative 1 over 11? Sure, why not? That's negative 8, that's positive 8, they cancel. Okay, cool. That's how it works, guys. Just plug that number in, okay? Plug it in. All right, let's move on. And look at that, we come across the direct substitution property. If f is a polynomial or a rational function, and a is the domain of f, then the limit of f of x as x approaches a is f of a. Once again, direct substitution, plug in a for x. That's all you have to do. Okay, which means for number three, this says the limit as x approaches pi of x times cosine x. Hey, let's use direct substitution property. Let's go ahead and plug in pi. Let's see what happens. You'll get pi times cosine of pi. This will give me pi times, now what is cosine at pi? Hmm, didn't think you'd have to use that unit circle ever again, huh? Well, lucky you. Cosine at pi is negative one. So here, we just end up with negative pi. All right, awesome. So that's direct substitution. If you can plug it in, why not just plug it in? That's it. All right, so let's try that with the same mentality, direct substitution property. Again, the limit as x approaches one of x squared minus one over x minus one. Let's do it again. Let's plug in one and see what happens. you'll get one squared 
minus one over one minus one. We end up with zero in the numerator, zero in the denominator. Now, zero over zero, and if you're thinking this, it is definitely wrong. Zero over zero is not zero, okay? Zero over zero is definitely not zero. In calculus, we call this zero over zero, and it's a specific form. Zero over zero is called an indeterminate form. And if you ever come across an indeterminate form, zero over zero, then this means you must go back to the original limit and see if you can fix it. And we want to know, can we fix it algebraically? So let's go back and look at it. We'll choose a different route. And yes, we can definitely fix this algebraically. Because look at the numerator, x squared minus 1. What can you do with that? You can factor it. So let's try it again. The limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1 times x minus 1 over x minus 1. Hey, that looks like we're getting somewhere now. And if you see it, your x minus 1s will cancel. And we are left with the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1. Where now, if you plug in 1, we'll get that our limit is 2. Now that is definitely better than 0 over 0. So if you ever come across this type of form, go back and see if you can fix it algebraically, of course. If you can't fix it algebraically, then there's a good thing that you learned how to do x, y charts and tables on the last lecture. Whip out that calculator if you need to. Okay. Awesome. And then down below is a little fact going over what we just did. If f of x equals g of x, meaning that if f of x turned into a reduced function g of x, just like what we did, we changed x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 into x plus 1. So f of x into g of x, when x can equal a, then the limit of f of x is also equal to the limit of g of x, provided the limit exists. So that's everything we did. So all it's saying is that the limit of the original function would still be 2, no matter what. Even if you reduce the function, you're still going to get the same limit. Hey, that was colorful. All right. Awesome. And now, you guys remember this from the last set of notes? I told you it was important. Okay? This is very important. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. We proved this by calculations. Now, since we have proved this, we can use this when evaluating limits. And you'll see the problems we will use them on. So just remember this limit property. I guess we call it a property now, or identity at that. We'll call it a limit identity. So to go along with that, what's also important is that 
if you flip it, the limit of x over sine of x as x approaches zero is also one. Okay, pretty cool, huh? I'll give you one more to remember. It's cool how it works out. Also, the limit as x approaches zero of tangent x over x is also one, which means that the limit as x approaches zero of x over tangent x is also one. So remember those limit identities as well. I'll even make them colorful for you. Okay. So given certain problems, you'll know when to use these. Okay. All right. So now we want to evaluate limits and we're going to do everything today algebraically. I'm not going to take out a calculator at all. Okay. So for number one, evaluate the limit as h approaches zero of three plus h squared minus nine over h. So again, if you plug in zero, this won't work out because if you plug in zero, your denominator becomes zero, which throws the whole thing out, which means go back, look at it, and fix it algebraically. And what we notice is that three plus h squared can be foiled, right? Three plus h squared, you can foil it. All right. So this means that we'll get the limit as h approaches zero of three plus h times three plus h minus nine over h. equal to the limit as h approaches zero. Foil this out, you'll get nine plus six h plus h squared minus nine over h. Your nines will cancel. And you'll get the limit as h approaches zero of 6h plus h squared over h. And then we do everything properly here. You can factor out an h, which means you'll get h times 6 plus h over h and your h's will cancel and all that's left is the limit as h approaches zero of six plus h which means it is now safe to plug in zero and if you plug in zero to six plus h you will get just six there it is. Now, in your evaluating limit process, you must include the limit each time, just like I did. The limit, the limit, the limit, the limit. You keep including it until you have used it, and you don't need it anymore. If you do not include it on every step, your work is not correct. So, just a forewarning. Make sure you include the limit on every single step that you do. It is only proper. Okay, and there you go. We have fixed this algebraically. All right. Number two, find the limit as t approaches zero of the square root of t squared plus nine minus three over t squared. Hey, we did this one on the last lecture. We did it with a calculator. 
now we get to do it algebraically. And when I said, when I say algebraically, I said to think of the conjugate. Remember what the conjugate is, right? The conjugate. If I said conjugate, This means that if I have a plus the square root of b, the conjugate would be a minus the square root of b, or the other way around. If it's a minus the square root of b, the conjugate would be a plus the square root of b. So the only way to evaluate this limit is to multiply it by the conjugate. And we are gonna conjugate the numerator, okay? We will conjugate the numerator. So this means that I am going to multiply this one by the square root of t squared plus 9 plus 3 over the same thing. Square root of t squared plus 9 plus 3. That is the conjugate. Okay, now remember, a conjugate is just a manipulation by one. Because if you realize that this over itself is just one. So we're not doing anything wrong here. We are manipulating by one. One is a very powerful number. And one can be anything, as you see here. One is the conjugate. So. That is what we're multiplying by, the conjugate. Okay, so let's continue. And with that being said, we will have the limit as t approaches zero, the limit as t approaches zero, and now what's gonna happen here is you are going to FOIL the numerator. So square root of t squared plus 9 times square root of t squared plus 9 leaves us with just t squared plus 9. And then there will be no middle term. The middle term will cancel because you'll get 3 square root of t squared plus 9 minus 3 square root of t squared plus 9. So your middle terms cancel. And all that's left is that negative three times that positive three, so you'll get minus nine. Over t squared times square root of t squared plus nine plus three. Okay, awesome. Keep going. The limit as t approaches zero, now you see in your numerator, your nines will cancel. So what you're left with is t squared over t squared times the square root of t squared plus nine plus three. And now I know you see it. your t squared will cancel. And we are left with one over the square root of t squared plus nine plus three. Okay, which means it is now safe to plug in zero. It is now safe to plug in zero, which means I'm using my limit, which means that you'll get one over the square root of nine plus three, which is gonna give me one over six. And there is our limit, one six. Now, if you remember from the calculations in 
one six was zero point one six seven. So that was a lot nicer using the conjugate, of course. Okay. Awesome. Keep going. You see, algebra is the basis for calculus. All this has been purely algebraic so far. That's it. All right, number three. Okay, here's when we come across our special little property. Okay, so number three, find the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 7x over 4x. All right, so for this one, we're going to bring back that limit identity we made. The limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is equal to 1. OK, so in order to evaluate this limit, well, let's go ahead and look at the identity. The only way this works is if the value of the x inside the sine function is the same as the x value in the denominator. These values must be exactly the same in order for the limit to become 1. So what I'm trying to say is if it was the limit as x approach 0 of sine of 3x over 3x, since this is 3x, since that is 3x, this limit would be 1. This limit would be 1. So that's what I mean when these values must be exactly the same. So this means that on the limit down below, you have the sine of 7x over 4x. So the number inside is 7x, and the value down below is 4x. How can we get a 7 down there? What could you possibly do? And the answer, again, is manipulate by the most powerful number. That number happens to be 1. In order to put a 7 in my denominator, I am going to multiply this limit by 7 over 7. Because again, 7 over 7 is just 1. OK. And now, let's see what we have. We have the limit as x approaches 0 of 7 sine 7x over, and I'm not going to multiply the 7 and the 4 down here. I'm going to leave it as 4x times 7. There's a reason for this, so just give it a moment. All right, now, for those of you who thought this seven can multiply this seven, do not do it, because you can't. Nothing can ever multiply into that sine function. That sine of seven x, that seven x belongs to sine and is never gonna change. So nothing ever, ever, multiplies in there. That's why that 7 goes to the outside. Okay, Do not make that mistake. You cannot distribute anything in those parentheses. Okay, All right. So let's do some rearranging down here. And when I say rearranging, let's take a quick moment to remember the associative property of mathematics. If I have parentheses A times B times C, 
then by associative property, I can rewrite this as A times B times C. And that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna use the associative property on four times X times seven. So, and it's called the associative property of mathematics, which means you'll get the limit as x approaches zero of seven sine seven x over, and now we're gonna have four times seven x. That's what we changed it to. Okay, now let's use some limit properties on the first page that we learned. 7 fourths is now my constant, is now my coefficient, which means 7 fourths can be moved to the front of the limit. So I can rewrite this as 7 fourths times the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of 7x over 7x, which means can we now use that limit property? Is this value of 7x the same as this value of 7x? And that answer is yes. We can now use that limit identity that we proved in, this, in the last section of notes which means that this whole limit becomes one. It's beautiful. Which means that we end up with seven-fourths times one, which is just Seven fourths. There you go. Well, does that mean that the answer is already given to you in the beginning? Quite possibly. Our answer is seven fourths. Well, look what was given to us in the original problem. You had a seven on the inside. Oops. You had a seven on the inside and a four in the denominator. And there's our answer, seven fourths. Maybe that's a cool trick, but you still have to prove it. Just something to think about. No shortcuts here, okay? All right, and that's how you use this limit identity. Okay, number four wants us to prove another identity. This says prove that the limit as theta approaches zero of cosine theta minus one over theta is equal to zero. So our job is to prove this identity. We want to show that the left side is equal to zero. So let's go ahead and start with the left side. Ah, kind of like pre-cal, right? A left side proof. All right. So the limit as theta approaches zero of cosine theta minus one over theta. Well, here's where you want to think about proving trig identities like you did in pre -cal. What was one thing you used to prove trig identities? And it's something that we used on the second problem. We multiplied by a conjugate. Multiply by the conjugate. That's all we have to do here. So I'm going to multiply this fraction by the conjugate of the numerator, which is going to be cosine theta plus 1.
over cosine theta plus one. And again, that is just one. All right, well then next we will foil the numerator. And I'm left with the limit as theta approaches zero of if you foil this, you'll get cosine squared theta. And then you'll have cosine minus cosine, no middle terms, they cancel. So you'll get cosine squared theta minus one over theta times cosine theta plus one. Notice how I never distribute the denominator. That's just the rule you should have in life. No matter what math class you're in, never, ever, ever distribute your denominator unless you have to. So, and most of the time, you never, ever need to distribute your denominator. Okay, let's keep going. So, what do we do from here? Well, cosine squared theta minus one. That looks like an identity in itself. So you see how pre-cal comes back in a big way. Cosine squared theta minus one. That almost looks like sine squared theta. Almost, right? So you remember your main trig identity. cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. Which means that here we have cosine squared theta minus one, which means that if I wanted to solve for sine, this would become sine squared theta equal to one minus cosine squared theta. Okay, so if you manipulate this a little bit more, let's say I multiplied it by negative one, this would say negative sine squared theta equals cosine squared theta minus one. And now does that look familiar? This is the same as this. So now we can make an appropriate substitution. We now get the limit ah, as theta approaches zero of negative sine squared theta over theta times cosine theta plus one. Oh boy, okay, well we're here now. Now what, right, now what? What do you see? Do you see a possible identity, limit identity we can use on this, right? So the most popular identity we know for now is that the limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over theta is one. Is it possible to use on this limit? And that answer is yes. But we're going to have to do some splitting, which means that it's a good thing we can split limits. Oop, am I writing too big? Probably. Oh well. Try to write a little smaller. I think I got the room though. So I'm going to split this into two limits. I'm gonna make this the limit as theta approaches zero of, and since it's sine squared, I have how many sines? Two. So I can make this negative sine theta over theta times the limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over cosine theta 
plus one. Okay. And again, we haven't done anything wrong. I have just split this fraction into two. If I multiply them back, we'd be back at the one you see on the left side. Okay. So now, let's go ahead and look at this. This whole limit follows our identity. But instead of one, it's going to become negative one. That's it. So this becomes negative one. And now on this limit, we are going to plug in zero for sine and cosine. So keeping along with it, I have negative one out front times sine of zero over cosine zero plus one. Still going, I get negative one times, well guess what sine of zero is? Sine of zero is zero over, guess what cosine of zero is? One. So you get negative one times zero over two, but none of this matters because the answer is just zero. So did we prove that this limit is actually equal to zero? And that answer is yes, this limit zero. Okay, awesome. All right, write smaller next time, all good. Hey, isn't this fun, right? Say, what's your idea of fun? Okay, so this says let g of x equal x squared plus x minus six over the absolute value of x minus two. So find the limit of g of x as x approaches two from the right. Okay, now the big question here is, what do we do with that absolute value? That is the biggest question here. And the absolute value has to be turned into a piecewise function. So I don't know if you've ever seen this before. And if you haven't, it's cool. But to start off with, we'll start off with the regular absolute value. The absolute value of x can be changed into the piecewise function where you have positive x for all x greater than or equal to zero. And then negative x for all x less than zero. So this is the piecewise function for the absolute value of x. But now what we have to do is translate this into that, which is not too crazy. So we'll get started on that first. So this means that the absolute value of x minus two is gonna become positive x minus two for all x values greater than two. And then it's going to be negative x minus two for all x values less than two. Okay, so that is our setup for this. 
And this is an important problem because it is now going to co connect limits to restrictions. It's going to teach you how to apply limits with piecewise function restrictions. So you can read a restriction and apply it to the actual limit. And one of your questions is maybe why doesn't say x has to be greater than or equal to 2? Well, the answer to that question is that x minus 2 is in the denominator. So can we actually be equal to 2? And that answer is no, we can't. Because if x is 2, the denominator becomes 0. So hopefully that answers your question. OK. So now we are going to use this piecewise function to help us work the limits. So that's where we'll start here. On the left side, we'll start here. So we have the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. So now, remember what a right-hand limit is. If I'm approaching 2 from the right, this means all my x values must be bigger than 2. So which restriction represents my x values being bigger than 2? And it's definitely the first one. x is greater than 2. So since we are connecting these with the limits, it's going to tell us what to output. <clears throat> so the numerator is x squared plus x minus 6. And since we are approaching 2 from the right, we are going to put this function, x minus 2, in the denominator because we are connecting limits with the proper restrictions. So we're going to get a positive x minus 2. Now let's go ahead and simplify. Can I plug 2 in now? The answer is no, because the denominator becomes 0. So this means that we're going to have to factor the numerator. And you'll get the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Uh, what is that? x plus 3 x minus 2 over x minus 2. And then you see that your x minus 2's cancel. And we get the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of x plus 3, where it is now safe to plug in 2. And we'll get that the limit is 5. OK, perfect. Let's try it again. We are now approaching 2 from the left. So we are now approaching 2 from the left. So we'll have the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. The numerator stays the same. But now since we are approaching from the left side, remember what a left-hand limit means. This means that your x values are smaller than, which would be represented by the second restriction above, which means the output function we could use with that restriction and this limit is negative x minus 2. And now let's simplify. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left of, again, x plus 3 times x minus 2 over negative x minus 2. Your x minus 2 is canceled. You get the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of negative 
x plus 3. All I did was take this negative and move it to the top. You can keep it in the denominator if you want. You're going to get the same answer. And you plug in 2, and we'll get negative 5. OK. Now, the last question wants to know, does the limit from both sides exist? But remember the theorem for the existence of a limit. In order for a limit to exist from both sides at a certain number, the left-hand limit must be equal to the right-hand limit. Well, what's the left-hand limit? Negative 5. What's the right-hand limit? 5. Is negative 5 equal to 5? No. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x does not exist. Do not eat. Yeah. All right. That was fun. They're all fun. I keep saying fun. Fun, fun, fun. Okay. What are you on? Last two? Perfect. All right. Number six. Again, use that special limit identity that we made or proved. And here's sine 3x over x. Well, in order to evaluate this limit, we need to make this value, well, we need to make this value look like the top value, which means we need to get a 3 down below, which means all we have to do is multiply by 3 over 3. That's it. And we will get the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 sine 3x over 3. And with limit properties, take that 3 out, move it to the front. 3 times the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 3x over 3. And by our limit identity, since this value is the same as that, oh wait, what did I miss? <laughs> I see it. Almost the same as that value. Don't forget that x. There you go. Now, since this value is the same as that value, we know that this whole limit is going to one. So you'll get three times one, or just three. All right. Perfect. Last one. Seven. The limit as x approaches negative two of x plus two over x cubed plus eight. Again, can you plug in negative 2? And that answer is no. You will get a 0 in the denominator, which means we must fix algebraically. And can how do we fix this algebraically? Well, if you notice, the denominator is a sum of cubes. And a sum of cubes can be factored. So this becomes x plus 2 over, and to factor the denominator, well, it's going to start off with x plus 2, and then it's going to become x squared minus 2x plus 4. If you don't remember how to factor a sum or difference of cubes, you should probably go refresh on that and make sure I'm right too, right? Okay, 
Well, you see that your x plus twos cancel and you get the limit as x approaches negative two of one over x squared minus two x plus four. It is now safe to plug in negative two. So you'll get one over negative two squared minus two times negative two plus four. And we will get one over four plus four plus four. What is that, 12? One 12. There it is. Okay, and that is calculating limits algebraically, right? Algebraically and using limit identities that we have proven. Okay, and remember, your best friend is one. Manipulate by the most powerful number, one. All right, that's it.